thinly sliced raw fish on plain white rice. How did this Japanese staple take over the world? And what has a tuna loving, controversial Korean religious leader got to do with it? This is the story of sushi and the way of tuna. It is hard to imagine how raw fish on sour rice could have become an American staple. Like it, it is everywhere. So, how could that have happened? Uncooked fish is undeniably sushi's calling card. But the name actually comes from a Japanese word meaning sour rice. Its origins trace back to China, at least as far back as 300 AD. But it was a long way from dragon rolls and salmon nigiri. They used to ferment fish in rice in order to preserve it. The rice would go bad and they'd throw it away and just eat the fermented fish. This came to Japan around 700 AD. But sushi's biggest shift came with the invention of vinegar a hundred years later. Now it could be made instantly, without waiting for the rice to pickle. And it was kind of a fast food at that point. The McDonald's drive through of, of old Tokyo. By the mid-1700s, in the largest city in the world, sushi was one of the most popular street snacks. In 1824, a street seller in Tokyo began hand-shaping his sushi to serve his customers quicker, inventing something that resembles modern-day nigiri. Despite its popularity in Japan, sushi was rarely eaten abroad. Then came World War II. The American post-war occupation of Japan brought in some strict food controls. And they were trying to restart the restaurant business, but the restaurants were not allowed to have any rice. It was all rationed to citizens. So the solution was, citizens could bring their rice to the sushi restaurant and have the chefs there make it into sushi. This particular style of sushi from Tokyo spread through the whole country, and the sushi industry was able to restart before many other restaurant industries in Japan after the war as a result. While LA had long had a little Tokyo, the US Immigration Act of 1965 opened the doors to a new wave of Japanese immigration. New Japanese restaurants began to pop up, catering to the wealthy Japanese businessman. A slab of raw fish sitting on top of rice was a little bit of a turn off to Americans at that time. And so was like very dark green seaweed paper. It wasn't something that Americans were used to eating. One Japanese entrepreneur decided to open a restaurant near the Hollywood studios hoping to attract some celebrity customers. When the Hollywood stars discovered this exotic, interesting, weird meal, it was kind of a thing they wanted to try out. Frank Sinatra going with his entourage and eating sushi, it became a thing. Meanwhile, across the continent, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, home of the American fishing industry, a controversial Korean religious leader, Sung Mung Moon, was convinced that America could fall in love with fish. He had had this kind of vision that the food supply problems of the world could be solved by harvesting more fish from the sea and spreading it all over the place. He always loved fishing. He, he liked fishing and shooting, but fishing particularly, and fishing for tuna fish. But who was this mysterious preaching fisherman? He was Reverend Moon and his followers, often called Moonies, believed that he was the Messiah, the true father of mankind. He was very forceful. He was very clever. His followers adored him. The newcomers learned to see Moon as their father. They, they called him father and his wife mother. He'd appear to them in dreams. Moon founded a unification church in 1954 in South Korea. But in the 1970s, Moon was giving speeches across the US and performing mass weddings, where he handpicked the couples. They were going around saying, oh, who's John married to? And oh, who did you get? They were marrying somebody who they would never have met in great big mass ceremonies. And so it was thought that he must be brainwashing them. He was one of the least popular people in a whole lot of polls in America in the 70s and 80s. Moon had been born in Northern Korea under Japanese occupation and was later imprisoned by the communists during the Korean War. 
his religion went hand in hand with his anti-communist ideology, which helped him find support in the US. He, he was very much in with the Republicans. Wherever he could promote right-wing or anti-communist um, a stance, he would do so. And he would pay out for this. He used his money for his political connections. Moon saw his church as destined to rule the world. He bought the conservative Washington Times newspaper as a mouthpiece. And a US Congress investigation even revealed links between Moon, the Korean CIA, and a political influence campaign. And then he had another time in prison in America on tax evasion. You can't say that his fishing industry was religious specially. Anything that was successful was God's success. Anything that wasn't success was Satan. So he had had all these followers, many of them actually from Japan, had come to the U.S. and they had tried already to start selling fish to Americans. It was a failure. They were going around with little refrigerated vans and trying to get people to buy frozen fish out of the back of the van, and people were not that interested. For the average American, hooked on a diet of TV dinners and processed meats, fresh fish didn't really feature. But Moon was convinced that tuna was the key to changing the nation's tastes. He was particularly obsessed with this idea that tuna could be the gateway to their fish distribution spreading in the United States. The cattle of the ocean, you know, the big red, red meated animal, right? In 1980, Moon gathered 70 of his followers in the church owned New Yorker Hotel. He gave a long, bizarre sermon called The Way of Tuna, calling them to spread sushi across the US. Health crazes and the invention of the Americanized versions, like the California roll, were already pushing sushi into the mainstream. And Moon invested in a lot of the sushi businesses. It started in New York and the East Coast and then spread Detroit to Chicago. Popularity of, of sushi was clear as a business opportunity. The United States, it didn't have the infrastructure for taking care of, of dead fish in transit. But the church-run True World's Food did and Moon's followers were willing, or pressured, to work incredibly long hours in difficult conditions to make it possible. There was this accidental alignment that occurred where they were had this network of people willing to work long hours trying to sell fish to spread this gospel, and you had restaurateurs who needed fish. True World Seafoods became this big conglomerate with ten, you know tentacles like an octopus everywhere all over the US. Today, there are at least 4,000 sushi restaurants across the U.S., where the industry is worth an estimated $27 billion. Sung Mung Moon died in 2012, but True World Food lives on, still transporting sushi-grade fish from Tokyo's markets to sushi shops across the world. It was certainly successful in getting the headlines the whole time, and in getting money, and in getting a considerable number of very loyal followers. Was sushi popularized by the controversial religious leader? Or did his profit-driven church just capitalize on a rising trend? One thing's for sure, his prophecies about tuna were right. It's gone from trash fish to one of the most popular sushi ingredients all over the world. But with many species now in decline from overfishing, tuna's modern-day popularity may prove to be devastating.